Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Rekha Pandey from the Department of History in the University of Hyderabad. The module that we are going to do today is uh, Women in Indian Art uh, with uh, a special focus on miniature painting in pre-modern India. This is a module which has been jointly done by Dr. M. N. Rajesh and uh, myself. Now, when we talk of feminism in arts, we find that this is a movement which has come about as a result of the contemporary women's movement. Now, women's production and reproduction is something which is totally uh, excluded from mainstream and it is only there for the purpose of consumption. Now, we, when meanings are produced and what comes out of these meaning is called representation. It is very important to understand an image because only then we can uh, understand the social knowledge, what are the assumptions and the values surrounding this uh, image. Now, art history is now accepted as a major branch of knowledge and it is supplementing various other kinds of uh, history. Now, art as a manifestation of human thought and spirit has valuable implications for historians to conduct their uh, investigation into the intricacies of the past. Now, a different perspective of women's history is gaining currency in which art forms like painting are being used uh, to, as tools of historical investigation. Now, it was primarily uh, because of the feminist uh, movement that the contemporary uh, women's movement in arts grew up. In the 1970s, feminist historians and critics began to question the assumptions which lay behind the masculine claim of universal value of history or of uh, you know heroic art and which had them systematically excluded women's production and representation from uh, its representation and they had powerfully transformed women's images uh, into uh, that of uh, for the purpose of consumption. I would uh, now request Dr. M. N. Rajesh to speak about uh, women's representation in art in ancient India. We go on to this uh, particular part on Indian iconography and paintings and some of the most important icons that have captured the Indian imagination and which were also exhibited as part of the festival of India abroad particularly in France and Russia is the Didar Ganj Yakshi one of the most important exhibits in the Patna Museum. This life stand, size standing image is a tall, well-proportioned, freestanding sculpture and is made of sandstone with well-polished surface. Now, why were these images commissioned is one question. But more importantly is how do we understand Indian art? Indian art, particularly in the form of iconography, can be understood only when we understand the non-verbal language known as mudras or ritual gestures so these gestures which are actually gestures which are represented in iconography convey a meaning which cannot be fully verbalized so we have the important image of the buddha so we have the buddha in the dhyani mudra or in the meditative posture then we have the buddha showing his finger to the index finger pointing to the ground which is known as the bhumi sparsha mudra in which he makes Bhumi Devi or the goddess of earth as the witness to his enlightenment and finally we have the Dhamma Chakra Pravartana Mudra or the Dharma Chakra Pravartana Mudra which shows the turning of the wheel of the law. The other important mudras are the Varada Mudra or the giving of the boons which form part of a large number of mudras which are around 3000. These mudras are the basis not only for iconography but also for painting and also for the dance traditions. And some of the most important dancers and dancers actually portray these mudras in their very celebrated form in a very subtle manner and the finesse is captured in their graceful movements. Now we have the important mudras which are arranged in a sequential pattern in stone and why are they arranged so because this was one particular method of bringing to light history the earlier method of bringing to light history was an audio visual presentation which was the unveiling of the scroll the scroll was known as the pata and the painting was known as the chitra 
so we have this scroll painting known as the Patachitra. So the Patachitra used to be unveiled in one particular direction and then the narrator used to narrate the events whereas the audience received this. So it is in this tradition of the Patachitra or a scroll painting that the early stone representations were carved out and one of the important examples is seen in the Sanchi Stupa where we have the ending of the architraves in two volutes. The, so the architrave ends in two volutes which represent circles or the closing of the scrolls. Some of the important themes taken were the apart from Didargan Jekshi is the stories which were cutting a chord or striking a chord with the Indian populace and most important of this were the ancient Buddhist texts and their narratives. We have the important story of Queen Maya Devi's dream and then the subsequent birth of Buddha in the Lumini Sal grove. So this is represented in Queen Maya Devi reaching out with her entourage and delivering the Buddha. Now we later have many of these images which are represented in different parts of the country which actually deal not only with Buddhist themes but also with a wide variety of religious traditions. For example, we have the Gudimallam Lingam which is one of the most important represent, representation of Shiva as part of the phallus imagery in South India. And then we also later have other aniconic representations of the Buddha. The earlier representations of the Buddha were all aniconic means he was represent, the Buddha was represented as an empty throne or an umbrella or simply the Buddha Pada, the footprints of the Buddha like the representation of the early Jains. Gradually with the evolution of time, the Buddha Padas acquired more and more characteristics or Lakshanas and there came to be more than 32 Lakshanas. While we have the larger traditions, particularly the Brahmanical traditions, we did not have any injunction on representation of iconography and so therefore the influence of iconography also was too overpowering for the Buddhists and the Jains to ignore. And this started particularly with the representation of the Bodhisattva during the Kushana period and then finally we have the full grown image of the Buddha. The early images were actually part of one tradition and these images are represented in Sanchi, another one in Barhut and later we have the polishing of these traditions that is the Barhut images are more two dimensional in shape. The third dimension is represented but the artist did not have mastery over this. And then we have the two major traditions apart from the Gandhara and the Mathura that is the two traditions of North India. The Gandhara tradition being in the extreme northwest of India and the Mathura tradition in North India. The other important tradition is the Amravati school in South India. The Amravati school has more free flowing form than the other two traditions. The distinction between the Gandhara tradition and the Mathura tradition is that the Gandhara tradition is also known as the Indo-Greek tradition in which we have certain Greek elements like the wavy hair, the wearing of the dress and also sharp features. Similarly, though many of these aspects are taken, they are represented in a more subtle form in the Mathura tradition where we have more Indian dress and the features are not so accentuated and the representation also has proceeded to excel in form. The best example of this is the Sarnath Buddha. The earliest representations of all the divinities both in the Buddhist and the Brahmanical tradition was one of a person who had enormous energy. Later traditions show that the person who is a superman is actually not one who is represented with enormous strength or volume but one who is looking inward to himself. Therefore, the best example of the Buddha, the Sarnath Buddha is an image which is closed eyes and looking inwards as if the person has conquered the self. So we have in addition to the mudras, we also have other iconographic conventions like the talas. So the whole body was conceived as part of the nine spans with each part of the body being allocated one particular measurement. It was this measurement and these mudras and 
particular posture like asanas and alidas that make the totality of Indian iconography. They were all actually handed down from one generation to another through the Shilpa Shastra or the Shilpa text and these were executed in practice by the guilds of artisans. So the guilds of artisans moved from place to place and there were slight changes in the type of materials they used particularly the stones and also each different tradition can be identified from some different features for example we have more flowery patterns among the hoysala architecture or we have fine elongation um, and dancing postures particularly in bronze among the cholas or large scale use of uh, black stone in eastern india to the use of marble in western india so where were these images housed these images were actually housed in two places, one either in the Buddhist temples or in the, the Buddhist temple, the Bud Buddhists had three important structures that is the stupa, the chaitya and the vihara. The early stupa was a reliquary in structure to house the relics of the Buddha and later the important Buddhists and also texts. So the uh, stupa was an encased structure, the encased structure was known as an anda on top of which was a harmika and we had a umbrella or a chatri known as a chatraveli which was a sacred space and therefore fenced by a harmika then we also have in addition to a reliquary stupa a votive stupa in which we had a small uh, chaitya this is known as a chaitya in which we have a small stupa inside the chaitya in which the faithful congregated and worshipped circumambulating in an apsidal form with from in a clockwise direction. This clockwise direction is also followed in the Hindu temple. The only difference being that the image is kept in the Garbhagraha which is the center of the temple. The third important Buddhist structure was the Vihara and the Vihara was a place to stay. So the Buddhists had to stay at one place during the Vasavasa or the season of the rain and because they should not trample on any living beings or newly sprouted plants and among the five structures in which they had to stay one the Hamiya or the Guha or the cave or the Lena out of this evolved the Vihara. Gradually the Viharas became Mahaviharas or monastic university. Many of the earlier Viharas were scooped out of large stones like the Vihara at Ajanta and there were cells for the monks and then later there were also kitchens and this shows the beginning of a community life in this Vihara. The earliest Viharas were in eastern and western India and the important structure was a prayer hall and also the cells. The examples are the Ajanta Vihara and these Viharas also served to house some of the other important artistic repositories like paintings particularly the Ajanta paintings of which we know. The Ajanta paintings were all made using natural ingredients and cover a wide variety of themes related to both royalty and also to everyday life. Some of the important paintings are taken from the Jatakas which form the essence and the stories are told via paintings. The colors used are predominantly earthy colors which is a particular marker of identification of Indian paintings. Paintings are primarily identified using three characteristics form, line and color. So here we have earthy colors which are one particular type of Indian paintings uh, representative and secondly we have the forms which are also free flowing unlike the later paintings during the Mughal period where we have a predominance of geometrical forms and then we also have the lines which are not very sharp. So this particular style of Ajanta painting which was housed became the model for paintings all over India right from the Sitanavasal painting down south to the impact of Ajanta paintings much down southwards in Sri Lanka and also as far as north as in Ladakh but after the imp imp transmission of Ajanta paintings to Kashmir. How did this happen? So this happened we see with the spread of Buddhism here but before this we will make a small deviation and talk about the rise of the temples particularly important exemplar is the Khajuraho temple. We have the rise of a temple with the idol or the archa in the middle for which the 
ceremony is performed which is known as the archana and then the devotee enters the temple has a, what is known as a sacred sightseeing or a darshana of the deity and then circumambulates the deity and then receives the offerings or the prasad and then ritually leaves the temple so this uh, the focus of the attention of the devotee is on the idol or the archa and therefore we have the garbhagriha or the womb of recreation which is a dark chamber in which the deity is housed slowly as the temple becomes larger in size then we have bigger enclosures or mantapas and these increase in size owing to the larger number of devotees entering the temple so some of these temples became larger and like the transition we have seen from the vihara to the mahavihara we have seen the temples becoming large temple complexes two important areas of temple complexes are the chola temple complex of brihadeshwara known officially as rajarajeshwaram and the khajuraho temples so the early temples had only one main idol but later with the rise of large temple complexes the empty spaces in the walls and the pilasters adjoining the abutting the walls all big, which were empty now became covered with large number of idols and also the the raw virgin stone was used to carve many idols on the niches of the walls etc so they served to also create a new iconographic program which included not only gods but also demi gods and also many other mythical beings like yalis and also supernatural creatures and also more importantly historical and uh, royal personalities like kings courtiers etc therefore the khajuraho temple the group of temples of which there are more than 30 has many jaina influences and most important for aspect for which khajuraho is celebrated is a sexuality but this only forms one part of the temple the khajuraho group of monuments is a group of hindu and jain temples in madhya pradesh southeast of jhansi and is one of the unesco recognized world heritage sites in india most of the temples were built between 950 and 1050 c common era by the chandela dynasty of these only about 20 temples have survived of the various serving temples the kendriya mahadev temple is decorated with a profusion of sculptures with intricate details symbolism and expressiveness of ancient indian art the idea of couples in sexual union is one aspect of kajuraho which is celebrated and also largely misunderstood and it was only seen as one part of a person's life the other three being artha dharma kama and moksha with kama being an integral part we also have other important images that came up in large number of temples in the regions of india i am emphasizing the word regions here to talk about the rise of vernacular literature which was actually patronized by articulate hindu dynasties in many of the regions like bengal orissa rajasthan gujarat etc and here most of these temples were built on the basis of puranic religions and some of the important themes are taken from the puranas and one important theme is of mahishasura mardini or the goddess who is the killer of the demon mahishasura so here durga kills the buffalo demon mahishasura which is a popular story that is represented in eastern india particularly in the sculptural traditions similarly like the deities we also have historical personalities like women saints were represented and in the thevaram tradition or the saivai tradition of south india which has 63 saints we also have women saints among them known as karekal ammayar who is one of the exemplars of the tradition of the uh, 63 nine mars she is represented in the iconography so we also have other saints like ramanuja being represented Finally, before we go, we come to Alchi, which is also known as the Ajanta of the Himalayas. Here, the most important pa- uh, uh, painting which comes is the painting of the Green Tara. Uh, Alchi is known as the Ajanta of the Himalayas because this was the second flowering of Buddhism in the Tibetan culture area, built under the patronage of Rinchen Sangpo in the ninth century AD. And here, the two important colors standing out are red and green. and this marks the end of an important chapter and the later paintings in this period lose contact with india and are imbued with more blue green 
and clouds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajesh, for giving uh, uh, us a good uh, information of how women are represented in uh, ancient uh, Indian art. And now I will move on to medieval period and I would like to speak about how women are represented in art in medieval period. And I would only focus on miniature painting in this segment. Now let me discuss a little about uh, the representation of women in miniature painting. Now what do we understand by a miniature? The word miniature has come from the Latin word minimum which means red lead and it was the principal pigment. The artists who were you making these miniatures were known as miniatory and slowly the word miniature referred to anything which was small in size. You know any painting which is done on vellum that is fine skin, copper, ivory, paper or manuscript. You know the slow small size was something which was referred to as miniature. Now some of the important features of these miniature paintings are that uh, they are very small in character both in actual size and treatment. There are very soft colors uh, used you know like pink, blues, green, brown and especially in the Deccan miniatures you have profuse use of gold and silver. You have large plants, flowering shrubs, the whole magical breeze of textile. There is transparent draperies. They have these, uh, you know, the women wearing long waist sashes, the men have conical turbans. It also depicts the environment, the rounded hillocks. Now, you know, when you look at these miniature paintings, it shows us that there is a lot of interest in the women's form. You know, because these paintings cover the various realm of a women's world at home, in the court, at work. Uh, it shows us a lot about her dress, her jewelry. And it also shows us that in history there is an unending interest of uh, art in women's history. It depicts the various realms occupied by a woman at home, in bed, in front of the mirror. There is a mother and child depiction. It also shows the kind of freedom which courtesans and yogins enjoyed. If we look at these miniatures, majority of these miniatures you know, they came to existence due to royal patronage. So there is a lot of depiction of queens and princes in this. But one thing which we should remember is that it represents a male gaze of women. And women are uh, idealized as symbol of royal splendor. You know, the earliest paintings which we have is of the tarif -e hussein Shahi of Ahmednagar. Now, Queen Khanzada Humayu sought to perpetuate the memory of her husband, Sultan Hussein Nizam Shah. And she was the one who got these paintings commissioned. A very interesting painting in this is, you know, it imitates the technique, the fresco painting of Vijayanagar. You can see a blue background and a yellow top, uh, you know, in the alcoves. The way the women are depicted are shown in very sensuous line. You know, it's very interesting to see that the women, her face is covered and uh, she is uh, seated at one level below the Sultan. The other painting is, you know, uh, in a public place where uh, there is, a, um, uh, you know, uh, there are several layers uh, of, you know, um, higher authorities. And uh, you can see, you know, it's a court scene. And uh, you can see a large number of people uh, standing in front of the throne. Uh, the people, the higher the authority, they are closer to the throne. But uh, the queen, you know, she is sitting there with her head bent. And uh, the whole painting depicts that the women are so uncomfortable in a public uh, gathering. They are all watching a dance, but the women does not even uh, look up to see the dance. But something which is very interesting about this painting is it shows us that there is not an absence of female portraiture in Islam. Besides uh, the paintings in the, uh, of the royal women, you have several of the Ragmala paintings. Now Ragmala paintings are when uh, you know the Ragas and Raganis are uh, uh, apostrophized as women. The whole evolution of Raga comes about, you know, when there is the need of the heart to sing. You know, you always had a tradition of chanting of mantras, but then in the raga you are singing. 
and it uh, provides you know a different uh, arena where we can see how women are represented you have a very interesting painting of the hindola rag from ahmednagar uh, around uh, 1590 to 91 you have you know it's a uh, depicting a holy scene there are female attendants who are shooting color and on top there is a verse which is uh, described in a sanskrit verse and it is talking about this whole scene again you have another scene where you know outside it suggests uh, spring uh, there is white blossom you can see the birds in flight and you have so many other paintings which depict you know the way women are represented either they are going out visiting a sage or they are in a garden next to the uh, king or the crown prince another very interesting miniature painting is of the dhanashri ragini where a woman is composing a letter to her lover you know the sanskrit translation of this verse is on the ground she sits wearing a red sari her breast wet with fallen tears you know and it uh, shows uh, a very interesting you can see a fusion of indian motifs and persian techniques another very interesting painting is of gauri ragini from ahmednagar you can see three women uh, standing in a grove of flowering trees the trees are depicted in a very circular fashion and they are filled with um, you know the whole miniature is filled with these trees the heroine in the center is wearing a lot of ornaments of mango blossom and the other two around her uh, seem to be maid who have helped her in this decoration there is another very interesting painting called the kamghodi ragini from ahmednagar which depicts two lovers in a garden scene they are shut out from the outside world where you can see strong walls marked and they are um, you know inside the garden the lover is turning passionately towards the women and the women turns her face away it there is a lot of intersection of diagonal forms and arch around the lovers another interesting miniature painting is from golconda called the todi ragini of 1680 the ragini drawn here is in very tender highly controlled line there is a lot of delicacy orange and pink is used profusely and she is going around a very rocky area with a ek tara you have deers following her you have a lot of birds it shows that the ragini is very much at ease with in nature and with the animals another interesting uh, painting is where you know you can see a lot of local style being used you know you have a splendid foliage of peacocks in bloom and the artist who must have done this painting seem to be more trained at the local folk level because that's the style they are using in this painting you know which depicts a prince in the garden with his uh, you know ladies you also have uh, a very interesting uh, miniature painting of uh, the ragini pratham shikha of bijapur and ahmednagar of 1595 it is found in uh, uh, the national museum in new delhi and this also depicts uh, women standing uh, with the prince the ragini paintings uh, some of these ragini paintings are found in salajang museum they are uh, you know the ragini painting show these women emits green foliage there is a lot of use of light yellow color in dress and uh, another interesting uh, painting is of a ragini who is again surrounded by ducks and deers there are banana trees you can see the mango blossoming there is a lot of green foliage which is surrounding this uh, uh, ragini another interesting theme which is taken up by the miniatures is the yoginis you know the yoginis have beautiful features they almost look like nobility many a times the yoginis are shown with matted hair they are holding musical instrument a uh, ek tara or fan which is made of peacock feathers they also wear shoes and they wear a lot of ornaments you know they are wearing in the deccan style uh the brocaded pajamas or the khase which is the upper garment they have long dupattas and scarf over their head they have smeared their body with ashes and uh, they are applying the kashka the paste of sandal to give them an ascetic look uh, dr ml nigam feels that many of these yoginis uh, come from a noble class 
though HK Sherwani feels that many of these yoginis were Sufi women and they were roaming around the jungles. Meer Hassan Dehlvi also says that uh, these women, you know, come out and um, they are not observing any parda. So they have this freedom to move about uh, very openly. So you have different kinds of views on to who these yoginis were. You have a very interesting painting from Bijapur. It is done by a doubling painter in 1605. It is extravagantly, you know, this yogin is extravagantly dressed and she is holding a mina in her hand and she is communicating with this mina. You can see a lot of European features in this. You know, there are fantastic plants surrounding her and it is almost like you can draw a lot of parallel with the Renaissance painting. There is a treatment of rocks from the Persian columns and uh, the plants look more like the drawing on Chinese vases. And um, you know, most of at this time, many there was a strong uh, uh, trade contacts, and many of the Dutch uh, merchants had come to Deccan via seaports, and these vases must have come with them. You also have a painting of some of these uh, yoginis visiting uh, ascetic, and the kind of attention they are paying to this ascetic, he looks very embarrassed. And, uh, you know, because they are transforming him into almost an object of worship. The background is very crowded. You have a lot of uh, people, places. But then it depicts a world which the yogini has left behind. And she has come into the world of the ascetic. You know, it now the painting is moving away from gaudiness to simplicity. There is another interesting painting of a yogini around 17th century from the Deccan. She is wearing tight pajama. She is having these elongated jama case, a brocaded dupatta. She carries a tambura. There are lots of pearls which she is wearing. And uh, there is a marble pepper border. And uh, the whole brilliant jewel-like effect is replacing the lush romanticism of the earlier period in this uh, painting. Another interesting painting is of a yogini from Salarjan. This is around 17th century. She is also dressed up in a typically Deccan fashion with the long jama, a narrow jari scarf tied around her hair. And uh, she has her arms crossed. There is a morchal in her left hand. There is a small girdle in which there is a small fruit knife attached to it. And the, she appears to be from a very rich noble family because the necklace she is wearing is of rupees. And so most probably it's a princess who is dressed as a yogini and she is carrying this dagger for her self-protection. You also have another interesting yogini painting from Bijapur where she is carrying a chauri in her left hand. She wears a bejeweled cap and she is wear, covering herself with a long coat. Uh, the princess is also, you know, looks like a princess. She is going around the garb of a yogini because the background, the kind of rocks, the whole environment looks typically Deccan in this painting. Another interesting painting is of a yogini from Salarjung who is wearing a long jama brocaded waist and a small scarf around her head. She is carrying a trident, a trishul in her right hand and there is a morchal in her left. She has applied kashka on her forehead with red marks in the center and most probably this yogin is associated with Shaivism. There is another very interesting miniature painting of a yogin from uh, yogini from uh, Bijapur. It shows a lion coming out of the jungle. She is holding a fan and a peacock feather. She is also very richly decorated and dressed. The other yogini painting for Sralajang Museum shows a very rocky environment where the yogini is coming to meet a visitor and seeking his uh, blessing. She is playing the ektara and the visitor, the yogi is playing the ektara and the visitors are listening. And obviously, you know, these two visitors who are visiting the yogi come from a royal family because you can see a balcony in the background and there is a, uh, you know, a male member who must have visited uh, them. He is also peeping from the background. Besides the, you know, women depicted in royal families, uh, the women uh, as uh, yoginis in the Ragmala painting, you also have a large number of miniature paintings which depict the courtesan. 
you have an interesting courtesan painting where a woman is holding a beetle leaf she is wearing gold black pajamas and a transparent robe she is also having elaborate jewelry you have another painting of sultan adil shah with a lot of courtesans in the garden it shows a very luxurious lifestyle of the sultan where he is surrounded by these courtesan it appears all of them are very drowsy with wine uh, and the sultan is holding the wine in his uh, uh, you know and the courtesan is holding the wine offering it to the sultan and you have a number of maids who are surrounding them you can see a lot of items of toiletry spread around them another interesting painting of uh, a courtesan is from golconda uh, from the period 1630 to 50 it is almost a virtual translation of the ifshani works into indian terms the azure background the violet and pink robes you know which are fluttering in the breeze the naked flesh till the waist there is you can almost see a lot of european influence in this painting another interesting painting of a courtesan is from uh, golconda where she is shown as wearing very diaphanous robes of pink while her veil and borders uh, of the painting are green she is holding a bird in her left hand and she wears a uh, necklace of pearls you know her dress is decorated with lot of roses she has a very sensuous form and the overall impression which this miniature painting gives is of sensuality you know the whole uh, covering is not to hide the flesh but to accentuate the whole uh, uh, flesh you know that's how the painting is depicted besides these you know you also have a large number of paintings which uh, focus on the common women you have maidens artisans you know who are working who are serving uh, the courtesans and they were all engaged in the royal services you have a miniature by ali nakvi of golconda where a woman is admiring herself in a mirror there is a maid who has helped her dress with all her toiletry which is kept at the uh, bottom and you know it is finally the mistress looks into the mirror and whether she is satisfied or not you know she is the one who will have the last word what is very interesting about these paintings and the way they represent women you cannot really see a class difference you cannot really make out who is the maid and who is the uh, princess in the painting because you know obviously all these paintings are for a male gaze and even the maids are dressed beautifully with enough jewelry with sensuous forms because both of them are objects of desire there is another very interesting painting of a sleeping girl you know from golconda and it is almost as if a tropical world has sprung to life you can almost feel as if there is a warm breeze which is blowing there is a very languid pace at which life is going there are a lot of food items luxury items which are uh, lying on the floor uh, there is a plantain tree in the background and uh, many art scholars have said you know these are scenes which are typically you know indian but uh, they they are found more in sculpture than in painting but here you have the same kind of a scene which is depicted in a painting there is another painting of again another maid helping her uh, mistress to dress up the mistress is admiring herself there is a red canopy on top with a green background and it almost gives a very easy pace to the whole lifestyle of the people another very interesting painting is from golconda where a woman uh, is shown who is again admiring her beauty she is wearing a very transparent robe there is rich jewelry the overall style is of golconda you know she has narrow waist bulbous uh, uh, body and the uh, she, there is a lot of uh, use of red orange and blue sky there are feathery trees depicted in this miniature painting another painting from bijapur is of a mini maid carrying a food basket and you know this painting really shows the point which i was saying that there is no difference between a maid servant and a uh, you know royal women because this maid is richly decorated she appears to be very sensuous she has the best of uh, clothes and nobody could associate her with uh, being a maid who is carrying a fruit basket 
you also have women depicted you know who are playing music you can see peacocks uh, made sittings on both sides of these uh, women to carry out orders there is a red border green foliage which can be seen in this painting there are various paintings depicting you know women sitting on the roof you have lots of maids you know ready to serve them there is also a maid servant carrying a child in her arms and the royal women is uh, sitting there enjoying the scene again you have a very interesting painting of a sultan you know first time shown uh, sitting on a uh, chair you know this is the first depiction of furniture in a painting you know because the europeans were coming into uh, india by this time and you have uh, the sultan or the emperor you know seated on the um, uh, chair and again this painting depicts a scene on the rooftop besides this you know many of these miniature painters they experimented with Euro european themes but what was interesting you know they since most of the painters came from the uh, local communities they tried to use european themes but put them in indian dresses and the whole uh, you know uh, painting uh, uh, becomes something very different you have a uh, theme of madonna and child here the sensuality of the women is not enhanced you know the breasts are now totally covered because now the breast is not seen as a sensuous thing but it is a site of nutrition and again she is uh, you have another scene uh, where you know uh, the women is totally covered in an uh, uh, islamic dress there is another painting where the women wears jewelry the there is a lot of border this is again a painting of a madonna and a child it has light yellow and orange color border in some of these miniatures you have the holy family which is depicted this painting is uh, you know around 1630 to 35 there are mary stands on the crescent moon she is holding christ in her hand and uh, the painting looks almost uh, very much inspired by european engravings and uh, you know the european portraiture combined with the deccani extravagance this is what this painting depicts and the holy family is shown you also have lot of paintings you know there is a very interesting painting of angels and fairies in golconda of 17th century it is almost a very eric composition you can see lot of animal heads around the trees it is probably some kind of a spiritual sign you know to protect royalty and this is depicted in a painting so therefore you know when we look at the miniature paintings in medieval times we find that women are represented in various realms as queens as princes as courtesans yogins maids as mother it also helps us to understand how femininity is constructed we have to realize that most of these paintings are there for male gaze you know this is a source of entertainment for men and women are depicted as object of sensuality and entertainment for men they have wide hips narrow waist they are an embodiment of female charm but then the role changes when the women becomes a mother you know then contours disappear and drapes appear there are different domains which these women occupy in the public space in the private sphere therefore you know miniature become a very rich source of constructing uh, women's history you know this is a very rich historical source which can be used for constructing women's history therefore you know in uh, uh, we can see that uh, Uh, you know uh, the way women are represented in art right from ancient period till medieval period we can really uh, reconstruct women's history based on these paintings thank you